Hello, you're listening to Streaming Audio in the last days of 2022. Yes, the winter solstice has just passed. The planet begins to turn a corner and make its way to 2023. And over here in the pod cave, we're digesting a few large, rich meals for the holiday. And I guess attempting to digest a large and rich year just gone by. Yeah, it's time to get reflective about 2022. For me, it was the first year in several where we've been able to get out into the world and meet up with people in person, find out what's been actually happening, take the pulse of the industry. So I thought it'd be fun to bring in a couple of my colleagues to wrap up the year, have a bit of festive reflection and a New Year's look at the year to come. So joining me are my fellow developer advocates, Robin Moffat and Danica Fine. And they're here with me, Chris Jenkins, for a 2022 wrap-up edition of Streaming Audio. Let's get into it. So the end of the year is upon us, and joining me to wrap it all up is the excellent Robin Moffat. Hey, Robin. Hello, Chris. And the ever-present Danica Fine. How are you doing? Oh my God, ever present. Amazing. So well, so well. <laughs> well, that's one of the trends of the year. I think you've been everywhere this year, haven't you? <laughs> oh man. Um, actually, later this week, I was supposed to go, um, well, I planned to go count up all the conferences I went to. And um, yeah, I think it was quite a bit, like 13 you've, or 14. You've a lot of a conferences. Lot. <laughs> a lot. <Yeah. laughs> and all signs of the pretty good for a first year. As a DA, you know? Yeah, yeah. You have yeah. you have got the air miles in, in a way that Robin has stopped doing. <laughs> I've completely, well, almost stopped doing. Just, almost. Just two conferences this year. Which two did you go to? The only two that were worth going to. Have to be something like London and current 2022. <laughs> <laughs> you may have been biased as you had something of a hand in those. Somewhat, somewhat biased, yes. And other, other good conferences do exist. You were chair of the program committee for both of those this year. Oh, Is that nice. the first time you've chaired a committee? Uh, yes. Yeah. So I've been on oh, the really? program committee before. Oh. Um, I'm first time chairing it, which was quite the experience. It was good fun, actually. And you're handing over that mantle to Danica. So I am. What, oh. What's it like? Because we've all been on the, on the committee, like rifling through abstracts, trying to find good mm-hmm. ones. What's it like being a program chair? It's quite fun, actually, because I've been to many conferences over the years, and you actually get to put your own mark on it. So you kind of, you have hopefully a good feel for what the community are going to be interested in, and you can actually push it in that direction. And so a bit more of this kind of topic, a bit less of that one, a bit more, just a bit bit more opinionated, which uh, I do have opinions now and then, which I generally do <laughs> quite, <laughs> except on Twitter. That, that um, one's never had opinion in my, that I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> it actually says it on the job posting, like shit posting and memes, it's that. <laughs> we'll bleep that out, thank you very yeah. much. It's in the fine print. <laughs> there we go. Well, handing over to Danica, I think Danica has opinions too, so that'll be just fine. Yeah, oh, Danica's, Danica's going to be awesome at it. No. She's, you're I doing Kafka Summit London 23, that's coming up. Yeah, looking forward to it. But it is pretty reassuring. I didn't realize, Robin, that this was last year was your first year chairing. Yep. So that that makes me feel a lot better. So <laughs> I could Seamless. definitely do it. It's great. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So that no, it's definitely definitely the kind of thing. Having been on the inside of it as a program committee member before, mm-hmm. um, even if just like for the boring stuff, like the platform that we use for abstracts and who the people are and all that kind of stuff. So. Having that experience already then makes like stepping up to chairing it kind of like less of a daunting step than like mm-hmm. if you just come in completely from the court. Yeah, decent yeah. tools. Like so. already, I feel like I didn't know what I already knew, and it's quite a bit. So just yeah. having experienced <laughs> it for the past year, so yeah, definitely, it'll be good. So be let's go on to that theme then, Robin. You, if you say you've put your stamp over which which kinds of talks to emphasize, what would you say is do you spot any patterns over the past year? What trends emerged in the what people want to talk about field? Yeah, and it's changed slightly with current because current we broadened the scope. Mm. Um, so it's not kind of like like for like. Um, there's less of the here's just how we run Kafka. Right? Obviously Kafka's like a, a kind of it's a um, it's well adopted now. Lots of people are using it. So simply the fact that you're running Kafka in itself isn't so interesting. 
And even Kafka on Kubernetes, thankfully, is also no longer particularly interesting. It's just like, you do it or you don't do it. It's like, either's fine by me, but um, conference talks need to be a bit more interesting than just that. Um, but it makes so it really alliterative. It's great. Yeah, <laughs> is that true. not enough? Is that not enough? <laughs> Not, not for me, it's not, though. No. Um, if you want to get into the Kafka Summit London uh, program for next year, you've got to make your talk title alliterative for, Ka- for yeah. um, Danica's sake. Inside tip. But, <laughs> but yeah, we're going beyond the, beyond the stage one thing of Kafka, I kind of feel. Yeah, so there's, there's still interesting talks about running it, but it's much more like real experiences that people have had beyond just like, well, I installed it and ran it and here's what I did, here's what I clicked on. But actually, here's the kind of things that went wrong and how we spotted it and how you can avoid it and like real useful stuff, which is like why we go to the conferences in the first place. Yeah. Um, So stories about stuff that people are building with it, like we've always had those. There'll always be interesting stuff that people are building. Um, I think one of the trends with current, with opening the scope up much more, um, there were like alternatives to Kafka there and like other stream processing technologies. But I think one of the big things there was the way in which people are like looking at stream processing and lots more people are getting into that now. Lots more technologies, lots more companies sometimes behind those technologies, ways of either getting data into a streaming platform or processing it whilst it's there. Um, so that's kind of like, that's definitely one of the ones. It definitely feels like it's starting to go somewhat mainstream as like mm-hmm. not replacing batch, which some people would like to do, but certainly as as part of a nutritious breakfast, as they used to say. <laughs> yeah, Chris, definitely. Like, well, Chris, you had your panel, right? So, you know. Yeah, your... yeah. We did that panel at Current. People like chewing over the discussion. Is, is streaming the future? Is it part of the future? Is it a fad? And there was definitely the sense that we're going to converge on something where streaming is part of everything we do. Yeah, and I think it's it's definitely going to be part of. I'm going to be really interested to see how big a part that is. Uh, I was watching just the other day. Ben Stansel did a really great talk at Current. Um, I think it was I think it's called Big Data is Dead or the end of Big Data, something like that. Hmm. Um, and the last part of the talk, I think it starts at about 24 minutes in. Um, he's talking about why doesn't streaming have this widespread, widespread adoption? Um, and his general point was, well, once it becomes boring and like, well, I may as well stream than not, like that's quite useful. But a lot of the use cases, like the kind of like the real time fraud detection or the notifications, like not that many people need it, particularly if you're like looking at it with a data engineering slant. Um, so it's and, until it becomes like, well, he was, he was putting it in the context of like the technologies and like the conference is all about the technologies. And like I just said, like, is it this one or is it that one? And people go to the conferences and talk about the technologies. Um, once that bit becomes just a given and it's like, well, it's as easy to stream it. So I might as well just use, use streaming instead of, of the batch option because there are benefits like your reports show more up to date data. Right? That's a useful thing. Yeah. But it's not necessarily as useful or it's not necessarily worth the effort of like adopting a stream thing if you need to understand all of these things behind it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It does need to get to the point where it's boring infrastructure in the best possible yeah. way. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Danica, you've been keeping a close eye on the KIPs this year. Anything in because you're the queen of our release notes these days. Mm. <laughs> Is there anything in there that's helping it to become more mainstream and boring in a good way? Ooh. Yeah, so that's that's a great way to phrase that. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, I, I like that it's not boring yet because um, like my my background in using Kafka was like every project we did was how do we make this the most complicated thing ever? And let's like let's dive into it and figure out all of the nuances of everything. Um, like we were pushing the limits of Kafka streams, which was just so much fun. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, just in, on, on that note, like I was trying to use interactive queries quite a bit for Kafka streams. And um, even a couple of years ago, that was, I mean, it was a great feature. You can access the, the information from your state stores and um, hit it with, you know, a REST endpoint, and whatever you want to do with that information. But it was still kind of yet a finesse it. And so there were a couple of kips that have been coming out last year or so that just make the interactive queries better, right? So we're at version two of those and like fetching a specific range of information. So it just makes it easier for the average user or maybe, you know, someone who wants Kafka to be boring, 
right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to get access to that information from their, you know, a relatively complicated application, right? So there's a lot of kips like that that are just, yeah, they are making it boring, which is really good for the wider range of, of users that we want to be yeah, using Kafka, right? Absolutely. And it kind of frees us up to do the more interesting stuff. I mean, we've had some mm. really interesting, what I would have thought were fringe use cases this year. Particularly, I mean, I'm thinking of on the podcast, we had uh, Simon Aubrey, who I'm sure you both know, talking mm -hmm. about um, using AI to track animals in his back garden in real time. <laughs> and that was really I, cool. I read that blog. That was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like... I'm getting an alert because there's an 89% chance there's a koala wandering through the backyard. <laughs> Did he show a picture of his backyard? I'm very curious. Like, is that is that something that we're at risk for? Like a koala just wandering through his backyard? I mean, that's, a, that's a question for a different sure. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a larger risk of a giant poisonous spider wandering through his backyard, but oh, that's yeah. also worth having real-time data about, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. But meanwhile, we have had some of the, again, I don't want to use the word boring as a pejorative, but we've had some of the more kind of living with it type topics. Like um, we had a podcast with Nicoletta Verbeck on like the things you need to know once you've got past the basics. Yes. Right. And I know oh, you did a blog series There's with her. So recently. many of them. So yeah. many of them. Yeah, that podcast was so. Um... I'd say inspiring just because of my experience with Kafka because, <laughs> you know, you wish that you knew ahead of time all the things that, yeah, not not can go wrong, but like all the things that you might just miss, right? Because it's a pretty yeah. complex system uh, for better, for worse. And yeah, so we, we got together and put together a blog series that we hope to continue uh, indefinitely because there is just that much information to cover. Um, but really taking people back to just the beginning, the absolute beginning. And like, oh, if you're encountering an issue with Kafka, well, I'm not just going to give you a Band-Aid because, well, that's that's most of what we want, right? Is how do I fix this specific issue that I encountered yeah. right now? But when we do that, and I've been guilty of that, I just want this fix right now, help me. Um, I don't understand. I don't understand what caused that problem or if there's yeah. something else that I'm doing in my system that made this issue arise. So that's what the blog post kind of walks through is, all right, how do we take everyone back to the beginning and actually understand the nuances of the system and some configurations that we may be playing around with and not knowing that they can cause issues down the road? And yeah, yeah so maybe maybe that will make things more boring as <laughs> yeah. well. So yeah. that's the theme. Let's make Kafka boring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we might have to try and rephrase this for the title of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, yeah, I don't yeah, know if that's going to fly. <laughs> we, we're kind of reaching that point where you know you can build a producer and a consumer and get real time data and think this is great. Suddenly, my data is being processed in real time, and then you know, like to pick on a victim, Linger MS. You set Linger MS to one hundred instead of whatever the default was, and things get a bit better. And you think, oh, mm -hmm. great. <laughs> but you've got to, yeah. we've got to start developing that deeper mental model of what's going on in the way we yeah. probably have as an industry quite a deep mental model of relational databases without realizing it. Mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. And with things like Linger MS, it's like, as soon as you start playing around with those levers, like they're not just in isolation, right? <laughs> yeah. That's going to affect 14 other configurations mm -hmm. that you've never heard of and you never wanted to deal with. Right? Yeah, yeah. And you have so. to have the mental model of what it's doing because otherwise you're just mm -hmm. randomly setting numbers and hoping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's that great quotation, isn't there, about randomly jiggling things until they unbreak? I can't remember <laughs> yeah. who, who said it, but it's this uh, it's this idea that you actually have to understand from the bottom up, like what's actually going on. You can't just like find the top hit on Google and like make that change and then hope that things mm. will just fix themselves. Yeah. yeah. But usually that top hit on Google fixes it, and then we just move on with our lives. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the, you always end up with a better longer term fix if you understand just yes. one step below the abstraction, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any good talks about that, Robin? The kind of getting past base camp into stage two of Kafka adoption? Uh, I'm not sure if that's what you're asking. I saw a great talk just last week from Brendan Gregg, I think from 2012, about oh, really? performance analysis. Right. So nothing to do with Kafka, but about troubleshooting performance problems. And it was fantastic. Um, and he just, it, it's funny, like 2012, God, that sounds like, yeah, that's ancient in like technology years. That's like, surely that's out of date. But it is as relevant now as it was then, and it always will be, just like talking about how you 
how you take a methodical approach to troubleshooting performance and like going through some of these great anti-patterns. Like there was the, um, the street light anti-pattern and this idea that like you, you, you hit a problem and you obsess over the things that you can examine. So you, know, you pull up a web GUI and it's like this thing has got like this spike. It's like, oh, wow, like here's this spike. I need to go and look at that. Yeah. And the, the, the story that goes with it is this, um, there's a drunk um, on the pavement. He's like looking for his keys underneath the street light. And the policeman comes along and he says, oh, can I, can I help you? So he says, I've lost my keys. Um, the policeman says, oh, did you drop them here? He says, no, no, I didn't drop them here, but like, it's the best light here. So it's this idea yeah. that you don't want to be looking underneath the street lights. You need to actually understand what it is. Um, and there's a set of, yeah, it's a really, really good talk. I'll make sure we put it in the show notes. Mm, yeah. But sometimes it's so hard to know, we, you know, if there's only one street light, to stretch the metaphor, if there's only one street light in the area, that's the only place you really can look, right? I mean, it's often hard to know what you should be looking at under the hood. Like Nicoletta's list of tuning parameters you wouldn't know to go and look for those unless you had someone guiding you, right? Well, I kind of disagree. I think you need yeah. to understand. So, like, so okay, so advertised listeners in Kafka, let's like pull it back on, onto onto topic, as it were. Hmm. And that's one of the advertised listeners is like, so if people listening to this haven't come across it, it's like to do with how Kafka brokers communicate with the client and you have to configure it correctly, particularly on things like Docker or if you're on EC2 or whatever, because otherwise things don't work. Or they kind of, they work a little bit and then they stop and it's really confusing. And it comes up again and again over the years on Stack Overflow and everywhere. And there will be answers like, well, just hard code your hosts file, which <laughs> is like a horrible <laughs> approach, but it kind of works until then it doesn't work when you move between environments. Like you have to understand what's going on. And uh, this is one of those things I kind of get a little bit kind of um, uh, un, un um I won't negotiate over whatever the word is because you have to, the, whatever you're working with, you have to understand it enough to be able to troubleshoot it. And mm. that's sometimes a bit idealistic. And sometimes people have just got a deadline and they need to get the thing written and like, just give me the answer. Yeah. But if you're serious about understanding technology, like you need to understand like, well, if you've hit this error, what's the error mean? And like, go and look up how the listeners work in Kafka. And, and I wrote a blog about it and it gets a ton of hits because the actual documentation in Kafka it literally explains it, but it doesn't explain it enough. So it's like, a, I guess, a gap in the docs. Mm. But uh, that's why I like blogging. Like, you find something that's not documented so well, I'll go and write a blog about it, and that'll help a mm. bunch of other people hitting that problem. Yeah, and it's yeah. the same thing with performance and everything else. It's not like if you don't know it, then you're daft. But I do personally feel like if you're going to work with a technology seriously, you do need to understand, like, under the covers, the next level down. Like, well, okay, so what is the end-to-end flow here? Or when it does this, which bit happens next? And mm -hmm. that's the beauty of open source. Like, you can actually go and look. And if you can't figure it out, there's a great community out there who will help you figure that through. So Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I think you have to, you dig until you find the fix, but then you, for to future-proof yourself, you want to keep digging until you really understand why the fix fixed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes, sometimes you can't find the fix until you understand it, but we've all been guilty of just setting it to the magic oh, number that seems to work, definitely. right? Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. But another trend, I mean, so there's the technical trend of like getting to stage two, but I've definitely noticed kind of the social trend of streaming technology maturing, which is you start to get companies now thinking, data mesh is the buzz term, but thinking about you know, treating their data as something that you've got to talk to other departments with. Instead of talking to other departments with APIs, we're talking to each other with data now. And that's definitely becoming a bigger trend. I don't know. I'm going to I'm gonna put uh, Danica on the spot there. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, because you've been, you've been speaking to customers a lot. You've been out there. You've been dealing with KIPs. Do you think this is going to be part of the part of the journey going forwards? Absolutely. Okay. So most of the conversations that come up around that, especially with customers and just people out in the field, um, it's it's always folks that haven't, they're like, oh, this seems intriguing, data mesh, like it's going to solve all of our problems, right? <laughs> um, this, is the, this is the next yeah. best thing. I mean, that's what happens with, with buzzwords, right? And then asking questions about how to actually implement it. And yeah, of course, we have we have a data mesh demo and here, this is exactly how you might implement it and, and, and use it. But um, I, as we get deeper into the conversations and like, what are you actually getting out of data mesh? Like treating treating your your data as sort of a product and and 
changing how you communicate with other areas of your company. Um, they all seem to, and this is my personal belief, is that it's a set of best practices, right? You don't have mm. to implement it in any certain way. It's just understanding how to operate in this space, this data-driven space, in a more responsible way, right? And when you get to that point, and that's kind of what it is, it's like, okay, you don't, is, is the fixed data mesh, or can we dig a little deeper and understand the best practices that are actually supporting data mesh, right? And just start to work with those instead of just focusing on this buzzword, that fix, right? Yeah, so that actually yeah. comes pretty neatly full, full circle in that conversation because uh, that's kind of what I've been pushing for. And it's really cool that in having conversations with people, they kind of come to that on their own in the middle of the conversation. Like, oh, wait, okay, we can just focus on those couple things. And if we do that, we'll kinda, we're going to get to that point. That's, you know, and... I, I like that people are excited about that because those best practices are good and they are best, right? Um, it's always nice when the best practices actually are best, right? And they're not too complicated and it's just, um, they make sense, right? They're, yeah. they're intuitive. And so, yeah, I think that is going to be part of the journey moving forward because if you want to use your data efficiently, um, I think I think that's a really big part of it, so. Yeah, yeah. I think you say, like, best practices around solutions. I almost think that data mesh is partly a solution, but there's no codified way of doing it. It's partly a way of codifying mm -hmm. what shape your problems look like. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. have a problem that if you can't deliver data to people, things are going to be more difficult for them to cooperate without coordinating. You yes. have a problem that if the, you're publishing data to them, then you need some kind of SLA for that. You need some kind of guarantees about quality. And it's mm -hmm. almost... Is data mesh a solution or a description of of the trouble you've got ahead unless you solve it? Maybe it's just the street light. Is data mesh the street light? <laughs> <laughs> There's a title for Love the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> My new talk with, with Adam Belmere. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Is data mesh the street light? <laughs> he's got he's got a book out. Anyone get a signed copy of that book at current? No, I missed that on that. There was a big long queue for it, there wasn't there? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's hot topic. Man, I'm just going to set up my own line at the next conference. You know, set up my own table. Like, I don't know what book I'm going to sign, but it's not mine. <laughs> so, I don't have signing one, people's but... <laughs> house plants. <laughs> Here, here's a leaf from my plant. Um, That's another one of my yeah. favorite things that I've seen a bit of. Again, referencing Simon Aubrey, but also you and other people. Um, IoT related fun stuff. How have you so? I know you have a future IoT related project. Tell me about that and how people have reacted to your uh, plant project over the year. Oh man. Um uh, I didn't expect people to be that excited about it. You know, I was first year as a DA just uh mm. trying to find an interesting project, like one that I find interesting, right? Because then that's that's going to be a driving factor for me. I want to build this selfishly and yeah. it's going to be useful and I think it checks a lot of boxes as far as, you know, what should people understand when they're trying to build an end-to-end -end pipeline. And yeah, so it's been really, really well received. Um, I've, you know, I, I think people are excited they that it's a fun way to learn the end-to-end -end pipeline. And then I inevitably at every conference or speaking engagement have at least one person come up and say, okay, how do I build this in my house? Because I need it. Or like my, <laughs> my, my girlfriend has too many plants. <laughs> like, how do I, how do I build this for her and stuff? <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> All right, like, let's do it. Um, so it's, it's so, it's so much fun to me that people are that excited about it, that they want to build this. And even if they haven't used Kafka before, they um, are inspired to do that or something, something similar. Um, and yeah, and I think it's, I've got a whole backlog of random IoT projects that I want to build out now because I was like, it was easy, right? It was pretty simple to integrate it. And there's so many random things that, that you can put together. Yeah, so. it's fun to do, um, to do stuff you can actually put your hands on when we're dealing with a lot of abstract ideas. Mm -hmm. And it's fun mm -hmm. to scratch your own itch. Yeah. In a way. There's um, one thing, this is completely off topic, but one thing I found this year that's really interesting me is, um, have you heard of a program called Pico8? No. It's, um, so you remember the age of 8-bit consoles like mm -hmm. Nintendo Entertainment System yeah. and the Game Boy? Pico8 is a development environment for writing those for a fantasy console that never really existed. 
but it's this wonderful like tiny IDE that you can draw sprites and pixel maps and compose music. Uh, if you have kids, oh, wow. start them on learn. It's based on Lua, and you can start them coding with a complete build your own games environment. And the one thing it lacks, which galls me, there are no network primitives, so I can't connect it to Kafka. Because I really want to do like <laughs> that would make an amazing talk, wouldn't, wouldn't it? it? Like fantasy console game, browsing oh, your cool. topics or something. That'd be awesome. <laughs> oh man! But, yeah, that would have been super cool to connect to your your choose your own adventure game. That would have been yeah. super cool. Yeah. Oh man! I um one thing I meant to ask you, Robin. For ages, you had a matrix display on your back wall. Yeah. Um, like IoT it's thing. A... You, did you ever connect that to Kafka? No, it was. It's called. It's a Divoom, D I V O O M, and it didn't actually have an interface that I could find that I could use. I don't oh. know if there's like a, an unofficial API somewhere, <clears throat> um, but you had like the phone app, and you could like draw a sprite or find one, and then send it to it. Okay, so I guess no you'd have SDK. to like, sniff something. Not that I could find. No, mm. um, maybe there is, but and that would be fun. Um, but yeah, definitely. Because be I fun. have, I have um, an Adafruit Matrix portal which mm. I've been trying to do something with. But it runs a version of Python. And this is getting on to something, a trend I'd like to see in the coming year. It runs Python. I can't get a Kafka client onto it because uh, the Kafka Python library depends on no, um, RD, librd Kafka. Mm -hmm. So it's C mm -hmm. bindings, and I can't get the C library on there because, you know, yeah. too much pain. And it's like... I would, I would like to start seeing next year. This is my hope for the future that we start <laughs> seeing more Kafka clients and more li language libraries mm. that aren't necessarily dependent on the underlying C library that we publish. Yeah. yeah. Did like, you try the the REST API? Yeah. I so that's that's my backup plan. I so far yeah. I've been struggling with um, SSL. <laughs> Ah, I keep chipping another, away. Another at it. fun thing. Yeah, SSL on IoT devices that can be a lot of fun. Yeah, but that so was one of the things that took me a week to set up on my phone. <laughs> yeah. I remember just like, "All right, Google, tell me the fix." And then, like, yeah, that was just <laughs> yeah. one of those things again. So, so um, but that leads me to where I want to go. Just finally, um, that's my hope for next year: broader, more diverse client libraries. They're getting away from this idea that Kafka is largely a Java shop, which is nonsense, mm -hmm. but there is that Definitely. perception. Mm -hmm. What what in your fantasy Kafka 2023 <laughs> streaming world do you hope to see, Robin? Oh, um, like you say, more better support for other languages. Um, that's, it's always been a problem. It's still it's getting better, but there's like there's a huge amount more to do in it. Um, probably better connectivity, um, like just like general open source, like Debezium is like a fantastic example, like more stuff like that, uh, more, um, yeah, more connectivity in that area. Um, but yeah, just general, like it's, it's not a Java thing. Like it is a Java thing, but like once you've got like managed services, who, clear, who cares what the broker is running in? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's make sure the kind of clients can use that, just whatever people want to code in. Yeah, Postgres is even a like C thing, Haskell right? or something like that. Haskell, yes. I'd like to see, I'd like to see Jay Kreps <laughs> announce proper support for Haskell at Current 23. <laughs> Jay, if you're listening, I'm prepared to help out with that effort. <laughs> dream, dream big. <laughs> Dream big. Um, Danica, what's your hope for 23? Oh, man. Can you repeat the question? What was the wider? It was like for streaming or for Kafka, for everything. For, for hopes, this world we're in, what, what innovation do you hope that we'll see? What's the main thing you, you're <laughs> crying out for that you think might happen next year? <laughs> no. Um, hmm. Oh, man. It's the end I mean, of the I don't think it needs to be a wider innovation. No, you got you two covered that. You two covered that. What I want, what I want for my end of year, my my winter gift that just keeps on giving for, for the next year or two. <laughs> I want, and it's what I'm trying to do with the blog posts that I write from now on is just teach a man to fish. Right? No more band aid fixes. I want as many people as possible to understand the nuances, that the levers that they're pulling for Kafka or whatever whatever project they're building. I want them to understand, even if it's only one person, that will be that will make me happy. <laughs> right, moving away That's from enough rope to hang yourself 
into the Enlightenment <laughs> era of Kafka. <laughs> yes, that's what we're hitting. Yes. <laughs> uh, the Enlightenment, the streaming Enlightenment. That could be uh, the catchy subtitle for um, for Kafka Summit London, which will be the next time we all meet together, I think. Yes. Yeah. Cool. I'm so excited. Looking, Looking forward to it. We're here before we know it. Yeah. Well, oh. good, luck with the, uh, good luck with the program <laughs> committee, Danica. Thank you. Robin, pass the torch successfully. I shall. And thanks very much. We'll speak to you again soon. Cheers, Chris. Danica, Robin, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to seeing what they both do in the year to come. And I'm quite looking forward to some new guests telling me what they're doing in 2023. So if you're one of them, drop us a line. I'd like to hear from you. As ever, streaming audio is brought to you by Confluent Developer. So if you're spending this festive period taking a break to work on a pet project or brushing up on your technical knowledge in the downtime, then developer.confluent.io is there for you as a resource to teach you everything we know about streaming technology. But until next year, it remains for me to thank our guests, Danica Fine and Robin Moffat, for joining us today, and you for listening to our technical explorations all this year. I've been your host, Chris Jenkins, and I will catch you in 23.